Basically, you guys know who I am. Uh, this was a paper presented at uh, Structural Congress uh, actually uh, a week ago yesterday. And I'll just get started. It's when roof collapses. Okay. Um, basically, structural collapses rarely occur. And uh, most young engineers and students really don't know much, uh, only know about a few major collapses. Uh, the, uh, most of the engineers in here would probably have seen this one. This is the famous Galloping Gertie Bridge uh, in, over the Tacoma Narrows. This is the Hyatt Regency walkway that killed a lot of people in Kansas City. And uh, this is the more recent one, the I-35 bridge collapse in Minnesota. Although these, these are interesting failures, they are not typical failures. These are exceptional failures that get a lot of press. So what I'm going to talk about more are the more typical failures. And uh, we're going to include not only roof collapses, but floors, walls, and other structures. Uh, this covers collapses. And when I say collapses, I really should say structural failures, because it's not always a total collapse. Uh, this includes activities in the US and in Canada. The Canada is included because their construction methods and design practices are very similar to the U.S. The age of their buildings are almost the same, and they get a lot more snow loads, and I'm interested in snow loads. Okay, I also used to work in Canada. We've excluded, intentionally here, extreme events. So tornadoes, major hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods. Luckily, there weren't many of them in the last year. But I would say a major hurricane is, is you know, one where you just devastate you know, a whole city or something like that. And that's usually handled separately for a, a separate discussion of that event. Um, fires are not in, included. We get a lot of buildings that collapse due to fire. But we do include it. There's a few cases where a building collapses due to, say, snow loads or something like that. And in the process of the collapse, that creates a fire. You know, it breaks the gas line, it pulls an electrical panel from the wall, and now you got a collapsed building that's on fire. That's, that happens occasionally, and we'll, and we'll show an, an example of that. Uh, we also are including collapses during construction. Uh, that's somewhat controversial, but we'll, we can separate that out. Collapses during construction, typically the entire building is not put together yet, and you're missing some pieces, so it's not surprising that it collapses. Certainly not as strong as a finished building, but, but in general, all the failures we're talking about here are preventable by simply applying the current standards. So in, in, in most of these cases, you can say something went wrong. Somebody didn't build the building right, or maybe didn't maintain the building right, or something happened that isn't a, an extreme event. Okay? Uh, sources of information. This is the difficult part. Basically, I could not have done this 10 years ago because the internet allows us to search new sites all over the country very quickly. Come on in, don't, don't hesitate to walk in and walk out if you need another piece of cake. Uh, uh, often we get multiple sources, and uh, one of the disadvantages is that the sources kind of go away. You know, a, a, a small town newspaper may publish something on an internet site, and in two weeks it's gone, okay? Uh, we try to get forensic investigation reports when we can, but quite frankly, most of the time you can't get them because if there is a report done, the insurance company will not release it or the owner will not release it or the lawyers will not allow anyone to talk about it. Okay, so uh, there's some pros and cons of using public sources. One of the big benefits is it's, it's uh, widely available with pictures and video and because I am not in any way associated with the building that collapsed, I didn't design it, I didn't build it, I didn't investigate it, I am free to talk about it. And that's unusual because normally the only people who can talk about building failures are people involved in the investigation of the failure and they're restricted in what they can say. Uh, there are some disadvantages though, is that since we're relying on secondary reports from news media and other forensic reports, sometimes, and in fact I would say most of the time, we're missing the details and we cannot determine with any high degree of certainty what the cause of the collapse is. And as engineers, we're interested in that. Also, the information, especially from news sources, may be inaccurate or technically wrong. Uh, but 
that's the best information we have. Okay? Uh, really what, what set the idea for this was I had an employer many years ago who asked me this question, how many structural failures occur per year? And I spent some time researching it, going to libraries, reading papers, and I couldn't find out. I eventually gave him a wild ass guess, but I really had no idea, I realized no one was ever recording this information. Now, I had always recorded structural failures just kind of as a hobby. You know, if I saw an article in the newspaper about a structural failure, I would clip out the article, put it into a file, but it was never really complete or done in any uh, logical way. So basically, I developed a search technique for searching the internet to try to capture anything that could happen on any new safe <coughs> sites anywhere in the US and Canada. And I really perfected this technique in December of 2009 and really started using it in, in a rigorous way. And so I captured all the information for 2010 for a full calendar year. Um, so now I know the answer. I counted 350 failures in 2010. <coughs> now I know a number. I, before that, it was really wild ass guesses. Uh, but this number is a lower bound. Obviously, there are some that are missed. If a barn falls down in the middle of a rural area, maybe it doesn't get any coverage by any news media or any source, and we just don't know about it. So, so, so this number is probably, the real number is probably anywhere between 10 and 50% higher than 350. But it's, it gives us actually a ballpark that we can kind of put there with certainty. This is a very low number compared to probably over 100 million buildings in the U.S. and Canada, well over that. So the frequency is very rare. And this is probably why this is not a big issue in the news media. Uh, okay. Uh, we can break down the numbers and we try to classify them. And I made up these classifications myself. But basically the biggest share of the 350 buildings were this area right here, roof, with snow. Now that doesn't mean the snow caused the failure. It means that at least snow was present. In fact, most of the time the, the snow may have been only near design load, not necessarily an overload. So something else made the roof fall down, but there was snow present. That's the largest percentage. Uh, we also have one here, what I call decks, porches, and balconies. Okay? Let me define my term. Most people here in Colorado know what decks are. You have them on the back of your houses or apartments because everybody wants a view. But a deck is attached to the house or apartment building on one end, extends out, and usually has some beams and columns out in the yard somewhere to support the other end. Okay? A porch is similar to a deck in a sense that one thing that's unique about deck porches and balconies is they're all exposed to the weather to some degree. So there's a maintenance issue. And, uh, a porch is like a deck, except usually the porch is designed in an integral way with the house, not just kind of added on, sticking out. And the roof usually comes out over the porch. So the main roof actually is designed to go over the roof. So porches usually have better weather protection than a deck. And a lot of the failures in porches are actually the roof of the porch collapsing onto the deck. Uh, and the third one is balconies. Balconies are common in uh, apartment buildings, condominiums. They're essentially a cantilever structure where the four joists cantilever out over a little balcony. It sticks out four, maybe about four feet. And there's a little area you can walk up to. And these, if they fall off, they break and people fall down. Okay? Uh, roof with, with rain, this happens a lot in uh, places like Southern California, Texas, uh, the south, especially on flat roofs. Uh, you get uh, cases where the, uh, basically the, the drains get clogged, water accumulates on the roof, and the roof barrier falls. Wind load cases, I remember I'm excluding tornadoes and hurricanes here, so this is high winds from other storms uh, there. Construction collapses, this last one, 21, so these are collapses during construction. And this is one here is collapse from only dead load. So this is a building that doesn't have any extreme snow, rain, or wind on it and just decides to collapse. Most of these are older buildings, but not always. And we'll talk about that. And this last one, this little sliver here, is floor collapses. And it's interesting that we have a large number of roof collapses, but a relatively small number of floor collapses. 
we'll, we'll go into that in more detail in a second. And then there's a few others, of course. Uh, now I'm going to draw this same pie chart, but instead of breaking it down by number of buildings, we're going to break it down by number of injuries. Okay? And the colors are consistent, so they're in the same classification. So when we break this down, whoops, too far. Okay, this is the same breakdown by number of injuries, and now the roof with snow, which was the majority of the pie before, or at least the largest segment, is only a small piece of the pie. And what has grown is decks, porches, and balconies. Now the reason seems to be that when a roof collapses, it makes a lot of noise, water leaks down, people run like hell. <laughs> but when, but when, a, when a deck collapses, who's on the deck? It's the people actually causing the load, not the snow or the, something else. Uh, construction collapses are significant. Uh, collapses from dead load are significant. And floor collapses, which used to be just a little sliver, are now, now a pretty big piece of that pot. So let me just back up so you can see that again. The floor collapse here was just that little sliver, and this deck, porch, and balcony suddenly expands to, to the big piece of the, pieces of the pot. Now, there's a third way to break this down is to uh, look at it in terms of number of deaths. Actually, the number of deaths from structural collapses is very small. 20 is what I counted in uh, 2010. To put this in perspective, last weekend, we had a major storm in North Carolina, it created a number of tornadoes. More than 20 people died in that one event. So, so compared to other natural disasters, uh, deaths from structural failures is very rare. And so these numbers are not really statistically significant because of the small numbers. But you can see that the bulk of them are construction collapses and collapses from dead load only. The others are probably not statistically significant to really measure. They may vary a lot from year to year. Okay, so what can we observe from this? First thing we can say, roofs with uh, snow loads are clearly the most common cause of failures. But in fact, they rarely cur cause injury, although they sometimes do. And I'm going to show a lot of examples here. I could, uh, each one of these tells a story. I could tell the story of why this building collapsed, some of the factors involved. In this case, these were wood arches over an ice cape, ice arena, hockey arena. There were actually a uh, hundred people in this building when it collapsed. This is only a small portion of the building. This is a very long building, you know, this, this is a hockey arena. And, you know, so some portion collapsed and people skated away <laughs> and no one was injured. Uh, and they actually rebuilt this building. They rebuilt the two arches. They were originally wood arches. They actually used steel arches in the replacement. Um, but I won't go on and talk with too much detail about a lot of the individual collapses here, just for time's sake. Uh, but the, the, the key is that we think in roof collapse due to snow, some warning occurs or the collapse occurs in stages. And people seem to, in most cases, escape. Not always. But in most cases. Decks are another story. Decks are, the, the load on the deck is caused by people. And so when a deck falls, people fall. And, and people are usually injured, although the distance that they fall is not very far, and therefore very few deaths. So a lot of injuries from decks, not many deaths. deaths. I think there was one death from a deck. Uh, the failure in decks happen for a variety of reasons, but the most common by far is the connection of the deck to the house fails. And weird things happen, usually the whole deck flips over in some odd way, and I'll show you some examples of this. This deck here was in uh, Kinley Park, Illinois. Really minor collapse. It turned out that uh, it's almost a brand new home. The home buyer said, I wanted a deck on my house to, to close the deal, and the builder said, yeah, I'll build you a deck. So he quickly went out, got a contractor, built the deck real quick, made the sale. Turns out because the home builder built the deck, the home builder is liable for that. And a lawyer collected a million dollar settlement on this for a woman who had fairly minor injuries, actually. So even though these decks don't look very serious, from a financial point of view, they can be a big deal. 